Who owns the music? Does owning music even matter anymore? I'm Ross Reynolds from KUOW, and joining me to discuss these questions are Rob Reed, tech entrepreneur and novelist. His new book, Year Zero, is about aliens who've been listening to music from Earth for years and have huge copyright issues. I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit more about that. Also, Shirley Roberson, who is a senior associate at Use Media Law, and her uh, job is to focus on licensing strategies for music and entertainment. Vicki Nauman is President North America for Seven Digital, a London-based media company that's one of the oldest players in digital music. And she did time here in Seattle at Real Networks and KEXP and KUOW. And also, Tony Kuehl, Vice President of Artist and Repertoire. a and still means Artist and Repertoire, right? Okay, good, good. At Sub Pop Records and Publishing, and Tony's uh, previously worked at Geffen and DreamWorks Records, where he uh, worked with Shabazz Palaces, Flight of the Concords, and David Cross, among others. So I wa just wanted to get started to get you to kind of identify where you approach this question of like who owns the music. Um, I was talking with some of my producers on my show a few weeks ago, and we were talking about. Uh, what about, why don't you just have your music in the cloud, or why don't you just use uh, Spotify or one of those services where you don't actually have physical possession of the music? And I was stricken with terror because I just remembered uh, the one time I loaned uh, American Beauty to my friend Bob Tomusco, and when he gave it back to me, it was just all scratched and awful. And I realized I had this kind of innate sense of owning music was really important to me as a consumer to have it on my person. And so you can answer in terms of professionally or in terms of your own personal use of music. Why don't you start, Rob? Sure. Well, um, before I became an author, I started uh, the Rhapsody Music Service, which you said Spotify and other services like Rhapsody were still out there, a million subscribers. Um, I'm no longer associated with the service. I sold it a number of years ago. And I started Rhapsody because I was tired of loaning out MP3s to people and getting them back scratched. And um, that happened with, no, I'm kidding. Um, the, the thing that I find um, intriguing, I, so I no longer have anything to do with Rhapsody and my interaction with music is mainly as a absolutely rapid consumer of it. And we were, uh, I think it can certainly be argued, uh, maybe a decade ahead of our time, a little too early with Rhapsody from the standpoint of consumer acceptance of, of unlimited streaming services. Um, but there's really starting to catch on now, and it is principally because of Spotify's tremendous success. Um, Rhapsody is still chugging along and doing reasonably well. You know, there are other services that are out there, and it's, it's interesting when you see the activity on, on campus and how it's spiking, that this sort of unlimited streaming service approach is becoming more and more accessible. Accepted. And what I find very liberating about it and have for over 10 years is just the fact that the, to, to replicate the access to music that I can have with a Spotify or Rhapsody subscription would literally, it's a billionaire's music collection. I mean, to have that completely unfettered, completely unlimited, full catalog, heard of something vaguely, it doesn't cost me 15 bucks to explore this new artist and so forth. Um, I think it's very liberating and it is also very frightening and I think that it's the, um, that we are entering an era in which ownership models are modifying and a good example is zip cars. Zip cars have made car ownership more optional for more people than car ownership used to be absolutely required for some folks who can get by without it now. And I think that the internet is enabling that more and more in a lot of areas and I think it's very liberating. Tony, you, you work with musicians, you're at a record label at Sub Pop. How do you approach this question of who owns the music? <clears throat> I mean, it's, at one level, it's a, it's a philosophical question, and then there's the legal definitions of who owns it. I mean, at, at root, there's two owners, I think. There's the artist or those who the artist decides to assign ownership to, through whether it's record labels or management deals or publishing contracts and, and that aspect. And then there's the consumer, the person who's bought this you know, MP3 album or, you know, or God bless them, an LP. But <clears throat> as far as, you know, when you come to the stream, uh, then it, everything kind of goes out the window and you're nobody, at least there is no real consumer ownership at that point and that may be fine. I don't know that everybody is going to, you know, continue to have the romantic relationship with the, you know, owning the CD that you can loan to your friend and hopefully not get returned, uh, destroyed, um, but, I, I'm. I, I've done. I kind of. I guess I agree with Rob. I don't know that ownership is necessarily going to be something that consumers continue to care about. Uh, from the label perspective, 
we're just trying to make sure that we are everywhere that our artists expect to be and, and that we are collecting revenue in every way possible, um, whether that's from you know, Spotify or Rhapsody streams or YouTube streams uh, is becoming uh, you know, a huge source of work for us, uh, if nothing else, and hopefully actual money. Um, but I mean, at, right now it's difficult to get I mean, it's consuming a lot of our time and energies, but the reality is, is that it is the tiniest of fractions uh, of our actual revenue at this point. Yeah. So it's still difficult to really get overly concerned with. I mean, and we're still making plenty of money selling uh, actual, you know, records to people. So it's a kind of a confusing subject in and of but, itself. But you said, God bless those who buy, buy vinyl. So when it comes to sub pop and the artists you represent, <clears throat> you're better off when they're actually buying the music as a physical object? Uh, you know, I, we're probably better off when they're buying an MP3 download. Uh, I mean, the, the margin, I mean, it's, it's, we're talking pennies different, but there probably is a slightly better margin there. Uh, and it's certainly less work. It's less, there's less overhead as far as warehouse space and, uh, you know, there's less printing and packaging and assembly involved. So there, it's easier to keep up with. There's nothing to keep up with. You put it up, it's there, and it stays there forever. You don't have to worry about making sure the stores continue to keep them in stock, let alone your own stock and inventory. So um, that is slightly preferable. However, um, I do believe that people who own albums, uh, particularly LPs, have a stronger relationship. Uh, so you're talking about kind of super serving a super fan uh, and creating a deeper relationship, which hopefully you can then find other ways to monetize than perhaps you know people who are that invested in an artist that they want to have the largest physical artifact possible that represents this music um, is probably somebody you might also be able to sell a t-shirt to and get out to a show and whatever else you can think of to sell to them. So, I mean, that's the crass, uh, you know, level of it, but it's true and, um, yeah. Vicky, I, th I think from what I've talked about with you, it sounds as though you're kind of between those who own the music and those who would like to lease the music. Is that a fair description? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> You know, at Seven Digital, we're a music platform, and so we power the music experiences for about 300 different companies globally, and that spans from radio streaming services to MP3 purchasing to full cloud-based on-demand streaming. And what we're seeing is that there, you know, if you go up 5,000 feet of music and music lovers, that they music lovers like to have a lot of different sources for music, for discovery. That's why radio really worked, you know, because you could put, you know, punch the little buttons in your car and you could hear different music. You experience it, you discover it, and then there's a subset of that that actually resonates with you as a music consumer that you love and you want to have that and you want to have access to it. And we see that increasingly there's a, you know, there's an experience of buying and ensuring that you have access to that music. You don't necessarily need to download it, you don't necessarily need to have that physical object, but you need to know that you're either bookmarking it in the cloud and that you know you'll always have access to it, or that you are uh, streaming it in a service that you're going to be subscribing to and you will always have access to that. So we see access to a subset of the music collection and that the idea of a collection is still very much alive, uh, but it's not the same as in high fidelity when you have 26,000 albums in your and CDs in your apartment. Um, so we're seeing, you know, we're seeing shifts that are taking place. We think the cloud and ownership are not necessarily two different things. And, um, and we're trying to meet the consumers with where they want to be with their music, which is connected devices that I have a, you know, I have a phone, a tablet, a laptop. I always want to know that if my music is digital and I have a collection that I can get it regardless of what device that is.
Shirley, you're uh, the lawyer on the panel. I am, and dressed so, like it too. <laughs> <laughs> so talk a little bit about how you approach this question of who owns the music and what kind of legal perplexities it involves. Absolutely, as Tony indicated, there's a legal perception of and, and point of view for ownership. It starts with when it's created and who manifests it and then making sure that if you do want to change owners along the path of sharing it with the community, that as you share it, you are getting out of that experience what you want. And it may be monetization, but it could also be the feedback from the community of what your music is doing for them and, and the experience that you're getting out of it. And so when you loan your CD out to somebody and it comes back scratched, uh, do you have rules set up for compensation of what happens of that experience and it was not what you expected? And so our law firm is uh, set up to not only protect those ownership rights and walk them through the path from the originator to the user, but also make sure that we alleviate some of the stress for the artists so that they can focus on the music and the creation and not worry about running a business and interacting with uh, managers and those kinds of things and that we take care of their legal perspective. Um, at our law firm, we're kind of unique because we've set ourselves up to work as general counsel. So we'll not only address the licensing issues, but we can help you um, set up your LLC to protect your personal assets and help you with the business perspective of actually being an artist in a very um, business-oriented world. Of course, a lot of people don't follow the legalities of music at all. And it was a much bigger yes. problem earlier in the digital era. It's become less of a problem, but is it still a major issue when it comes to ownership of the music? Are there a lot of people who are just aren't paying attention to the legalities? I think there are people that are not cognizant of the legalities and that legalities exist. I think there's one sphere of people who just think that it's okay to pass it along and don't think about the damage that you're doing to the artist or the record label or whoever the owner is of that intellectual property. And then certainly there are, there's the other side of um, things where you've got professional pirates who are out there and stripping and, and doing real damage to the industry, I think. When you look over the industry, though, are most people sort of within the legal fence or are most people who are uh, getting music outside the legal fence? What's your guess? Um, I'd like to say that my experience is that most people try to work within the confines and they respect the ownership and um, you know it, it's also geographic and it depends on what your community allows and what your country allows and when you start looking at international you know acceptance of what is and is not correct um, then it can get a little amorphous when you get out there. Rob, in your novel, you take a look at people who are not only outside the legal fence but outside the solar system yes. and, and fictionalize this question. It's of not rights. fictional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the basic premise of the book is that the universe is um, dominated by this vast alien civilization that's so into American pop music that they accidentally commit the biggest copyright infringement since the Big Bang, thereby bankrupting the entire universe, and it is entirely true. Um, and it, it, it is on a certain, it is primarily a sort of a madcap science fiction adventure, but it does spend a fair amount of time lampooning some of the mistakes that I think uh, the music industry writ large made around the copyright issue um, by the, the, the two issues, in my opinion, um, that were biggest were, first of all, the, the fact that the first um, portable MP3 players came onto the market, um, the first mass market portable MP3 player basically came on the market in late 98, the Diamond Multimedia Rio, and rather than embrace this medium, the Recording Industry Association of America sued the manufacturer in hopes of making portable MP3 players illegal in this country, um, unlike assault weapons and other things. And so for five years after that period, um, the record labels basically refused to allow the sale of digital downloads. And we're talking about the major labels, not the is indies. This the, is this the alien book or is this real? Th this is all real. <laughs> um, and the aliens will come to you in a moment, but I, I want to talk more about this because I'm not hawking my book yet. I will get to that. But yeah, so this is actual reality. And so for a period of five years, the labels refused to license their music uh, to people who wanted to download it, and as a result of that, there was this, you know, electrifying new medium of downloadable music, and the only way to access that and get all the advantages of, of portable downloads uh, was piracy. And so, as a result of that, the tragedy is that the industry essentially trained consumers to be a technically proficient and b unfortunately morally comfortable with piracy because there was no alternative. Now, that's taken the better part of almost a decade to change. Now that you know, downloads are very 
very easily and frictionlessly available at a fair price and so forth, that's kind of starting to shift. But that was one big thing. The other issue that I think is more subtle is the fact that laws have been passed that are so radically disproportionate um, with the crime of stealing music. The maximum penalty for stealing a single copy of a single download of a song in the United States by law is $150,000. And people see laws like that, and they see them being enforced, and this very law was enforced twice in the last few months, uh, wiping out a guy from Boston who uploaded a couple dozen songs, and then there's this other ongoing case with a woman named Jamie Thomas. And people see that, and you, you, it becomes very difficult to respect that law and to view um, people like myself who seek to make a living from copyright and work, I'm an author, we stop looking like property crime victims who merit sympathy and respect, and we start looking like the coddled favorites of a ham-fisted government that's enslaved by its special interests. So anyway, the book kind of plays around both of those issues and the fact that in our zeal to do what is something that does make sense, you know, make sure that artists and, and creatives get compensated. We can overcorrect to a degree by, you know, embargoing our product or creating incredible criminalization that's actually contrary to the interest of everybody in this ecosystem and is very, very damaging. Um, and John Hodgman reads the audiobook. I just had to throw that in. Anybody who saw him on stage last night, he's very funny. But I think I, I, I think the other point is that you know that from an application developer standpoint, you know, we have people coming and pitching to us all the time what they want to do with our platform. They want to license the API. They want to license the platform. They want to do X, Y, and Z. And the you know the labyrinth of licensing that we have to explain to an application developer developer or a technology company of why this streaming experience is, you know, that's a DMCA and you need agreements from ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, Sound Exchange, and now EMI Publishing and possibly Sony ATV. And then if you want to do this with on-demand streaming, then you need all the majors and you need the publishers and you need this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, their heads just start spinning. And they say, well, let's just go on and create an Instagram instead. Right. And so there's a, there's a huge risk in the marketplace for innovation right now with music because in addition to the consumers being, being very confused about what is legal and what isn't legal, and if, you, you know, if your favorite blog has free MP3s up, are those legal or illegal? Nobody knows. It's the same thing on the business side, and we feel like you know, we're really trying to foster innovation, really trying to foster and cultivate companies that want to innovate with music, but it's so difficult because they just see a, a minefield between them and a successful product. But, but is it getting better? I mean, a business like yours probably didn't exist 10 years ago, so there's certainly people moving into this area and figuring out all these licensing issues and kind of bringing the ownership of music within some kind of a legal structure. Is, that, is, is it getting more improved that way? It, it is getting better. It is getting better. And I do remember, you know, I was on one of the first music product teams at Real Networks when we licensed music and it was a joint venture with the major labels and one of the major labels wanted to sell us their, uh, their, their dog tracks on their albums for $4.95 per track wholesale. <laughs> it's better than that, sort of. But it's still it's still really difficult because there are you know there are some well honed models. There's DMCA compliant streaming, non interactive streaming. There's MP3 purchasing. There's radio, and then there's having some kind of a um, on demand streaming subscription, and there's promotional use where you can give away music as a promotional campaign. We support all of those things. Those are relatively well honed. Uh, models, but there are a lot of things that that you know that not a day goes by when someone everyone's looking to differentiate in the technology world. So then they say, well, we want to give people, you know, what if they own their songs and they want to start a radio stream and they want to play the songs that are coming out of their own collection, and then do we need to pay royalties on that? And how does that work with DMCA? I mean, there's there's you know a myriad of of gray in between each of these models that the copyright law and and the licensing rules are so far behind. And so there's just a constant push and pull. And I think even more than, uh, you know, I think companies by and large that we talk to want to do the right thing. They want to license music and do it legally. 
Um, but I think, you know, Turntable FM is a really interesting study that they went out, they launched something, it didn't have all the rights, they got a tremendous amount of traction, and then they decided, okay, now we have to go and get the rights for our service, which is kind of falls in between interactive streaming and radio, and it's taken them like two years. And so time is the most expensive thing for anyone who's trying to pave a new path with music licensing. Tony, how many people have su has Sub Pop gone after and tried to sue for $100,000 uh, per song? Uh, that'd be zero, <laughs> none. Uh, and we're also not, thank you. Uh, it was my decision. No, uh, they, um, and we're not uh, members of the RIAA. We do not pay dues or participate in any of their lawsuits or shenanigans. Uh, disagree. Uh, pretty intensely with the way that they are pursuing their strategy, but I do I do think that you know Taking four or five years after the invention of the first mp3 player. I I don't think that that's crazy knowing there are this many convoluted hoops to jump through and knowing how complicated the system to sell these things has to be and to coordinate that with all of the labels major and independent alike uh, makes you know, absolute sense to me that it would take a couple of years. The, the problem, of course, is the ham-fisted, ridiculous, you know, methods by which the RIA decided to put the brakes on progress. But I do think that there's something healthy to somebody pressing on the gas and somebody pressing on the brakes. And, and that's, you know, that's how we slowly move forward carefully and cautiously. Unfortunately, it did, you know, potentially create this system by which, you know, consumers were turned into pirates. Um, and we've taught them to be amoral, theoretically. I don't know for sure that that's true. I, uh, I don't have a super high opinion of humanity, necessarily. I think we're all pretty much looking for excuses most of the time to justify our behavior. I, I can't even tell you how many times I've seen you know, 18, 19 year olds who did not live through any of that uh, who feel and are not aware of even the, are barely aware that there might be lawsuits happening who uh, feel completely comfortable you know pirating records and trading them all over the place and again I don't particularly have that big of a problem with it I think there are just different kinds of people who are enjoying music differently and we luckily have a number of people who are willing to pay for the music but these people seem to think for the most part and I'm totally stereotyping a number of folks who I see posting on Facebook and whatnot uh, that you know artists make so much money on the road um, that there's really no point in you know giving money to record labels which I've heard from people are all corrupt and stealing the money and none of it makes it to the artists anyway and if you really want to support the music you should just buy a ticket to the show and having been to a, a fair number of concerts in my life, I can tell you that there are not a lot of people at the vast majority of shows that are going on. Um, they're, I'm not talking about you know Christina Aguilera at the Tacoma Dome, but the, I'm talking about the millions of smaller artists who are trying to break out and are you know slogging their way across the country every day to 10, 15, 20 people a night. Uh, and are struggling to make ends meet and honestly would not be able to be on the road at all if it wasn't for the help and assistance of the record label they were on who you know are paying thousands to ten thousands of dollars per tour to subsidize it in hopes that this helps generate record sales one day so and I know these people all believe what they're saying to some extent I think they want to believe it so much that they probably sort of believe it um, but it, it, it is maddening because it's so far from the truth. And meanwhile, nobody seems to care one whit that the artist has made this decision themselves. No, there's no labels, you know, breaking into these bands' houses in the middle of the night, tying them up, dragging them off, and forcing them to be on a record label and, you know, be slaves to this industry, archaic machine that's trying to sell records. You know, they've chosen this route. They've decided not to give their music away for free. This is how they've decided to monetize their music. Right. And that seems to go completely dismissed and, and disregarded, partly because I think any artist who has ever stepped up to kind of try to defend themselves 
has largely been shamed into silence immediately. Um, and, and that, I think, is a really bizarre, interesting, you know, state that we're in right now. So you haven't gone after any people who've stolen sub pop music, but I kind of feel like you sort of, part of you would like to punish them. I, I, well, I wouldn't want to punish them. I just, I think they're wrong. I, but I think, you know, people who run stoplights are wrong. And I think it's, I don't think it's as, I don't think it's as dangerous as running a stoplight, uh, <laughs> certainly. Uh, I, but I, it does, and I honestly believe that I, if I was scared for the future of my job and my company or the artists that I work with, I would maybe be more hungry for punishment. Um, the rea I'm mostly just angered by the sort of false premise that their entire philosophy is built upon. Mm -hmm. um, that, and, the, and their ignorance. I mean, ignorance, I think, makes everyone angry uh, when they encounter it. And that I know these people are wrong, and they have no idea, but they speak as if, you know, like all trolls on the internet, they speak as if they, you know, are behind the, the 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 scenes of every show handling the money, and they really have no idea. Um, but I, yeah, it does it does bother me. But I believe that no matter what, the job we do is yes, we sell records, uh, but we also you know we publicize this music. We get you know we talk to radio stations on these artists' behalf. We help pay for the recordings. We help pay for the band to tour. We are you know. In some instances, we help you know them with even the artistic choices they're making, and we put them together with artists to make the the covers and the posters, all that stuff. I mean, there is so much work, and I'd say 95% of it has little to nothing to do with actually selling these records. Uh, it, it, the the actual you know transactional part of it um, that I believe there may be a period where it's shaky and scary, but I believe as long as the work needs to be done, and I know it does, that at some point the revenue will work itself out. And, and it's up to us to stay agile enough to be able to attach ourselves to the revenue that is still there. And there will always be some, it will likely be less, mm -hmm. um, but there will always be some, and I think all of, I'm, I'm guessing that probably all of us you know, are doing the jobs we do because we are true music fans. And if I'm not making as much 10 years from now as I am now, and I'm not making all that much now, I will still be doing the same job I'm doing because I love it, you know? Shirley, uh, Vicky, after kind of enumerating all the continuing difficulties of licensing and, and determining ownership and what it's going to take to lease music, kind of conceded that it's getting a bit better. You're, you're also in the same field. Do you feel as though it's getting better? I do, and I think that we're giving artists more flexibility, that if you don't want the big label involved and you don't want to um, have someone doing all of those things for you and you want to take control of your own product, um, that there are so many more avenues to do that today because of the di digital age and what we're doing with social networking and all of the different platforms that are out there that are available. And I think it's a great bridge. We might be seeing one of those bridge parts of time right now in the development of, of this uh, product that, you know, in 50 years, we may be looking back and laughing at some of the things that we're using now as tools to get us to where we need to be. And that's the exciting part is that we've got the flexibility of having, you know, um, labels like Sub Pop and, and or if you want to go on and sell your music yourself through Facebook and Twitter and all of the social networking that's out there, you've got that option available to you now. What we try to help with from a legal perspective is if you're doing it, you're not stepping into a minefield that you don't even know about. That did you comply with Facebook's uh, terms of use and privacy policies as you're selling your product over their platform? And if you choose to d use new and different alternatives, are you going to suddenly have something explode in your face that you didn't even expect? And, and nobody's pursued yet because you're the first person to do it. People are always going to uh, own vinyl and buy vinyl and, and purchase and own recordings in the traditional sense of having it physically with you. But that's certainly plummeted a lot. I mean, there's a, a bump in vinyl sales, but a lot of other sales of, of actual holding the music have gone away. You were mentioning 50 years from now. Are, do you think the idea of owning music in that sense is really going to be diminished 50 years from now? Will, will many more people be taking advantage of what Rob was saying and what's been called the celestial jukebox, the fact that 
You can, you can listen to anything you want to. You might not have it physically in your possession, but you'll be able to listen to it. It's funny because we were talking about that in the office this morning of how when I went to buy music and I was first going to a record store, I would flip through vinyl and pull up and be elbow to elbow with someone um, talking about the music and looking at the artist. And what I miss most other than the music itself is looking at the big giant LP artwork and the album covers and flipping it over on the back and reading who was involved, who's a producer, oh, this guy was a studio musician for this other group that I liked. All those things that you could now flip through on the internet and certainly go to a band's website and see those things, but it's not the same communal experience that I had in a record store when I was doing it. Do I miss that? Yes. Did I have the ability to sit um, and look at Spotify and see what my friends are playing at the immediate time that I'm listening to something else? No. And so am I glad that I've got that experience now? Of course. So it's that ju juxtaposition of taking all the good elements and trying to make them work and getting to a better product. Rob, do you think this idea of owning music will be a vestige of the 20th century? Yeah, I think um, much as the no, I mean, we're talking far out, like 50 yeah. years out. I, I think um, it, what you said about vinyl records really resonates with me. Um, when we abandoned the we as a society or community of music lovers abandoned the vinyl record for the compact disc, I think that was the sign that ultimately our, our loyalty to the physical vestige was pretty limited because the, the CD eliminated about 80% of the fun in terms okay. of the artwork and the tactile engagement with the medium. Um, the MP3 got rid of the other 20%. So when we ditched 80, we were going to get rid of the next 20. And when you're talking about MP3s versus streams, it really is getting very, very hypothetical in terms of one's ownership or interaction. It's really just become the consumption of the music. So I think if we go out decades, yeah, I think that it will be, it'll be akin to you know those who are reluctant to deal with um, ATMs and bank accounts versus dollars. It will seem very quaint once those of us who grew up with these physical totems and really loved them and appreciated them for their own for their own inherent value, once we're no longer part of sort of the mental sphere, I think it will look very quaint to a vast majority of people. There'll be, you know, just as there's, you know, folks who, who, who ride horses today, there'll be people who have collections and have a fetish for the physical thing. But I think for the most part, it will become one's collection of music, um, to your point, will be more those things that we've bookmarked and listened to 100 times and are part of our, lands, our mental landscape um, as opposed to something that we have in, in physical form. Vicki, what do you think? Do you think the, this ownership thing will evaporate in the future? Will we be going away from an ownership society when it comes to owning the actual reproduction methods? Well, I think that, I think that we already are. Um, but I think that what we're seeing is, I think there's a couple of different nuances around that. I think that in the U.S. market in particular, as opposed to the rest of the world, we've had so many startups and failures and great promises that, you know, you become a member of XYZ service and you'll have everything that you always want forever and then that service fails or something happens and you cancel and everything, you put all your eggs in that basket and you had everything bookmarked and now it's gone. And so there's a lot of people who feel like there has been a, lot, a loss of trust of what does this really mean in the digital era. And we're seeing, you know, I think that people are either, you know, I, I maintain access, you know, that people are absolutely willing to pay for access. And we have a lot of data to support that, that it, you know, whether or not that's an MP3 or a stream, people will pay for it if you build a really great user experience. But I think then it comes down to are you Pot, are you buying access and putting your collection in, you know, Google, Amazon, or Seven Digital, or Apple's cloud, and that you always are going to have your access to that, or are you renting access and are you buying into a subscription and that you want to have lots and lots and lots of things that you can try out? And there's going to be lots of different permutations of that in the future. I don't see one size fits all for consumers at any point in the future. When you said owning access, do you mean not owning the physical thing, but owning the ability to get that music? Owning the ability to get that music and listen to it for as many times as you want on as many devices. If you want to cache it on your, you know, your phone to go in the basement of the gym and out of connectivity, you can do that. That you are saying, I want to buy my, you know, 
like my black keys. You know, I, I want to know that I will always have access to the black keys in every way that I possibly can versus saying I'm just going to pay a subscription for everything and hope that the black keys will be in there and I'll bookmark it if it is. Tony, how about you at Sub Pop? Do you see the actual physical owning of the music as being a vestige of the past going forward? And more importantly, what does it mean to a Sub Pop and what does it mean to the artists who work with you? Well, I mean, currently we still sell quite a, a decent number of records. I, I believe we're a bit of an aberration. Um, I believe the independent label culture in general is, is aberrant and that we are currently selling more records than we did 10 years ago. But I, I think reality is, go, is catching up with us already, um, I think right now. Uh, and we're probably going to continue to see we're going to see the declines that the majors have, have clearly been seeing for a number of years. I think our, what would have been a decline for us, I think, was offset by the fact that the internet, for all of its usefulness as a piracy tool, is also, uh, you know, it's word of mouth on steroids, and that's what has always sustained the independent music culture, is we've never had commercial radio touting our, our bands and, and the music that we work with, so uh, we've, we've always had a very, you know, excited, vibrant, you know, enthusiastic audience, and uh, and now those people can, you know, really evangelize in a way they they really couldn't before. Um, so, but I believe that's going to slowly be offset, um, and, and can maybe even more quickly now. Um, so I don't want to dismiss the selling of records, but I do believe the future is in streaming, and and we can offset. Uh, the revenue, I mean, how, the average music consumer, how many CDs a year are they probably buying? You know, mm -hmm. 10, maybe? If you could get the vast, you know, the, the people who are buying CDs at all now to pony up for a subscription service that's $10 a month, it's pretty reasonable to expect that the economics will work itself out and the same amount of money will trickle in eventually to all the places where it's currently going to. I mean, there's a lot of evolution between now and this beautiful future, you know. But it isn't—it's not impossible to to see it. And uh, and I, my hope is that we get there um, before you know any. I hope there aren't too many hiccups between now and then. And I think I think with with sub pop in particular, and a lot of independent labels that have a small roster of artists that have legacy and that have a fan base and that really hone their craft. Um, that you know the idea of a fan and the super fan and people who want their entire album they don't just want a single they want the album they want to have a relationship with the fans they want to go see the bands on tour um, I think that that's also very different than you know ma really mass market where maybe there is just a single on, on an album and that's the only thing that's being sold and we're we're seeing a really big increase in album sales digital album sales and um, and we attribute that to kind of one you know one of two things. One is that we merchandise and price albums really aggressively because we want people to buy albums. But we also see it as definitely a pattern with artists that have uh, more of a strong following. That consumers are much more willing to say, well, I you know I know these guys. I know I like their last three releases. I'm going to go all in and get the whole thing, as opposed to cherry picking one or two albums that, or songs that they heard on radio. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that Tony sees a pretty smooth path to this future uh, when we're away from the ownership society. If I, if I heard you right, do you agree with that, Shirley? I do, um, but I think it's going to take really innovative participants to get there. I think that um, you've got to have some risk takers because what we've talked about on the panel, what I've heard people saying, we're looking at the benefits, the monetization, how can you make money, how can you survive as an artist. There are some liabilities that come along with ownership as well, and so that's why I don't think that ownership will ever completely go away, because who do you go to when you feel like somebody has plagiarized your work or taken that riff that you came up with? Um, ultimately, on the negative aspect of things, the owner is responsible for those liabilities. And so uh, you've got to have some risk takers in the evolution of where you're going with your business development um, so that if you do get out there on the edge and you've taken a, a, you know, a, a new perspective of where the business is going, that you can pony up and stand up and say, okay, you know, maybe that wasn't the right direction and, and we've established that and here is where the rules are going to go now. Rob, if we move to maybe the post-ownership of the physical thing, 
are there going to be winners and losers? Or do you think this is, would you expect this to be a smooth transition? You know, there's always going to be people in sort of the, the brawl of any major transition who come out ahead and below, but, and it's very hard to predict who they're going to be. But going to the notion of total revenue, I think that's really, I look at that as well. And if we figure we have a society of 300 million people here, if let's say two out of three people, um, anybody with a passing interest in music, and you were saying how many CDs do, we buy, do they buy, we don't really know. If we figure like two out of three people have enough interest in music that they want to have access to it. Uh, at 10 bucks a month, that would be $24 billion a year in the United States. And at peak music sales were 1999 at about 14 billion. So I look at that, I mean, that's a very, very big picture statistic, but I think that that is, you know, the underlying reality that's going to draw, drive what I believe is an inevitable transition to streaming over the, you know, a decadal transition, not next year or the year after, but 10, 15, 20 years. And so I see nothing but growth in the aggregate. And that means that ultimately there should be quite a bit more money in it for artists in the aggregate. And for those people who, you know, uh, fund the creation of the art and put the artists on the roads and, and so forth, there should be more money in the whole ecosystem for everything. And I am convinced that the consumer who will go from having access to a tiny, tiny fragment of the music in the world, which was the situation under vinyl and CDs and so forth, to having access to all the music in the world for more or less the same amount of money, they are going to be gigantic winners. So I actually think that over the, the full transition, uh, it'll be winners all around, but particular individuals are, some are going to do very well and some are going to do poorly. Uh, if there's people who have questions, just move to these microphones. We're, we've got about 10 minutes left, so feel free to step up if you'd like to uh, ask a question or perhaps you've got a comment. Or like, if there are musicians in the audience, I'd really like to hear from you in particular. Yes, sir. Hi. Thank you, guys. Um, so as we move kind of towards this world where fairly soon, even now, people are able to fabricate 3D physical, tangible objects from data. Um, what, what is it about music specifically that makes it so unique in the intellectual property kind of conversation? And going from that, where, in terms of who owns the music, what are your thoughts on people like covering a band on YouTube and getting their video shut down? Well, I, that's actually, I'm gonna jump straight to the YouTube part because that's uh, something I'm super fascinated with right now, and uh, Shirley can probably speak even more to this than I can, but actually the vast majority of uh, copyright owners uh, are, are choosing to allow the covers to exist, or even the cat video that uses the actual version of the song, and this to me is a monumental shift in uh, the way that the recorded music industry is treating, I mean, it's, it's almost the opposite of what Rob was getting at earlier, and it's just quietly happened that YouTube has put this little switch in there that says, allow user-generated content to use your materials, or block it. If you click the user-generated content okay, then you have opted into a revenue stream where you get paid, you know, 0. 0.0003 cents per view or whatever it ends up being, it's, it, it moves around. I wish it was actually as straightforward as knowing how many cents it was per view. Um, but that's a really big, big change and it, it can only happen in a closed ecosystem like YouTube. Um, but I see that as something that's really, there's a lot of, I have a lot of hope for the fact that that can happen now and that a lot of people are loosening their grips and, and allowing their music to just be used however random people choose to. How are people flipping that switch? Are, are most labels flip saying yes or is it primarily? Most indies? are now. I mean, majors and indies alike? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot, there's some majors and some artists who, who don't want to. And, and it's also a publishing issue as well. It's not just the you know the recording owners but the the publishing owners as well who have to sign off on this but uh it when we as a record label input everything that we release um whether it's a video or a cd or single or whatever gets put into the youtube fingerprinting system and then skynet scans everything <laughs> that gets uploaded by every random person in the world and they check it to see if any of our and everybody else's registered fingerprinted copyrights are in that material, and then we get an alert. And then, then we, get to, we can decide all over again. When we first put it in, 
we make the choice at that point, and the default is to allow, by the way. <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> and yeah, but it's it's yeah, yeah. pretty amazing, and uh, and I, I know from you know in in my experience, we're all for it. You know, let it let it ride. I mean, who wants to stop, you know, a viral meme in its tracks, right? You know, at the get go, and who's who's gonna know whether that idiot cat rolling around on the floor is the next meme or not. I'm shocked at which ones make the cut already. So yeah, let it go. And, and that may be a thing that ends up selling millions more records for you. So yeah, I mean, I'm fascinated. I actually see us opening it up. And there is something unique about music, but I don't think that there's, I, I believe there's something inherently unique about music because I love it so much. And to me, it's an art that speaks in a very specific sort of way. But really what's unique about music is we now live in a world where we've inherited this insane legal architecture by which music is governed. And, well, and publishing yeah. is, is critical in all of this. And that you, know, you can have, you know, our publishing laws go back to sheet music. And so you can have you know, 10 different writers on each song and then there can be you know, 12 songs on a release and so you have this web and in order for everyone to get paid in YouTube, you have to have all of those writers and everybody sign off so that it's 100%. And you know, there's just an, an in, insanely ridiculous complication on the back end of all of this. But you know, that's a legacy that, is, that, that music is really, really struggling with, is, is these long-standing rules in copyright and ownership from a creator's standpoint that just don't make sense in the digital world. Well, and also when you're looking at YouTube uh, specifically, you're getting video involved because then you're looking at synchronization rights and who did the video, and then you open yourself up to a whole s different medium that you've never dealt with before or was dealt with in a very confined area where you were creating your own music video and you took care of all of those rights before you even turned the cameras on. And so I think, you know, on the internet where you've got a camera and video going as well as music, you've got to be aware and just protect yourself of those things. Yes. Well, I just want to extend this conversation because as we know, um, YouTube is now going to allow uh, embedding it within videos to Google Play and to, um, uh, to uh, other websites. So again, uh, uh, riffing off of this business model, it seems like the business, in, uh, uh, the business of music is really holding itself back within uh, the, this new emergence of this ecosphere. So um, did you want to speak to any of the new models that are coming forward? I, I don't, I mean, as, as far as within YouTube, I don't think any, at least in my experience, I don't think anybody is holding themselves back. I think they are, I'm using every resource available to try to figure it out. And it is incredibly difficult. There's, I mean, we probably have a year's worth of work for three or four people to just dig through and clear all of the publishing, get all the correct publishing information input until everything is in three different ways and signed off on a half dozen other ways, nobody gets paid at all. And uh, so it's, it's an incredible amount of work to do when there's multiple writers on many of the tracks and you have say, you know, 10 to 12 songs per record and you have, you know, a, a, 1,200 records in your catalog, that's a lot of data to mine and correct and double check and get it all approved and into YouTube system, which is by no means, you know, I, I've kind of simplified it. It is not as easy as I made it sound. So that's just one, you know, on top of that, you've got, you know, you've got Spotify to reckon with. You've got, uh, we probably get a half dozen requests per week from brand new startups that are going to be the next Twitter, you know, and want us to input all of our data. And then we've got to go back and re-encode everything at iTunes because iTunes has decided to upgrade their AAC, you know, encode ratios. So now they want new information and you have to get all of this other information input for them. So we're constantly, I mean, I, I, we have so many more people dealing with this now than we did a few years ago. And it is all we can do to catch up let alone actually try to get in front of what's happening. And also, uh, kind of building off a couple things that were said, music is, in, is inherently kind of 
has this terrible headwind in that there's all this goo of copyright law that goes back decades and decades and decades that was specialized for different eras. I mean, like looking through the through copyright law is kind of like doing archaeology in Rome. You, you dig deeper and deeper. It's like, oh, there are the Greeks, there are the Romans. It's like, oh, player piano stuff is lurking here in mechanical rights. And oh, this is when they were trying to, f this insane law has to do with the fact that they didn't know how to compensate, you know, with radio came up in the 1920s. And, and all these things have built up and all these people have these weird conflicting claims and many of these things have to be battled out in court until there's a final answer. And so music has this horrific headwind that probably that probably nobody particularly wants, but there it is. Um, but at the same time, music because it, it's a, so much of a smaller file size than video, and because the replication is so much easier than when you're, let's say, printing a spatula on your 3D printer, which we'll all be doing in about four or five years. It's also kind of the canary in the coal mine, and I think a lot of the issues, the question was earlier asked, you know, why is music so different from 3D objects? The answer is it really isn't, it's just first. And I think what's going on with music right now will eventually be looked back upon as sort of a dress rehearsal, certainly for what happened and is happening right now in film and video. And the issue with 3D printers is gonna be very, very big when any designed object that's made with relatively simple materials soon and even complex materials five, 10, 15 years out can be you know, printed at home. All of these issues are gonna, are gonna rise up in, in industrial design and other areas as well. It's, it's gonna be quite a... I'm gonna wrap up the big session right now because we're just about out of time, but feel free to come up. We're not gonna be running out anywhere. And thank you so much, Shirley and Vicki and Tony and Rob.